Bio Vivacious. I'm Sebastian. Bio Vivacious is a YouTube channel dedicated to clear fundamentals of biosciences and make the subject exciting. After having understood regulation of glycolysis, now let us see how the coordinated regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis is happening. It is going to be a very interesting and slightly tricky. So I wish that all of you pay close attention to this particular topic. As we discuss the coordinated regulation of glycolysis and uh, gluconeogenesis, what we need to keep in mind is if these pathways are coordinately, if it is not regulated, there will be enormous futile cycle. So remember earlier I had given the example of a seesaw. So in a seesaw, so uh, there has to be a balance in a seesaw. So uh, if one pathway, both the pathways should be balanced. If one pathway is exceeding the other, so there uh, it will result into an imbalanced situation. So therefore, uh, this pathway has to be balanced in our living system to in order to avoid a lot of futile cycles. Otherwise, we will be wasting 2 ATP, 2 GTP, 2 ATP and 2 GTP per cycle. This will be the net waste uh, if this pathway is if these two pathways are not regulated. So therefore, these are reciprocally regulated. Remember, both the pathways are highly exergonic under uh, cellular conditions. So if the rate of glu glycolysis is actually, so this is enzymes related to glycolysis, the rate of glycolysis is actually regulated by the concentration of glucose in the cell. And if the rate of gluconeogenesis is regulated by the concentration of lactate and other precursor molecules and also remember that in a well fed state when the glucose level is high when the fuel conservation is uh, uh, that should be promoted okay so in the forward reaction as well as the reverse reactions uh, can be independently regulated in this pathway that is the beauty of this coordinated regulation so these can be independently regulated and this also can be independently regulated so these are the um, seven enzymes the three you are very familiar with these enzymes and the reaction it catalyzes so these three enzymes are involved in glycolysis regulation of glycolysis we have seen the regulation elaborately in a video these three enzymes are involved in the regulation of uh, gluconeogenesis and all these regulations are carried out through two mechanisms. One is allosteric regulation, other one is covalent modification. Now the covalent modification, in this case, we will focus on phosphorylation or dephosphorylation. Okay, so they it, it use, because these are all hormone related, so therefore it is using an uh, cyclic AMP dependent or glucagon dependent regulatory mechanism. Let us look at it. Let us begin our discussion of this coordinated regulation with the first enzyme which is pyruvate carboxylase enzyme which will convert pyruvate into oxaloacetic acid. Remember this is the enzyme which is present in the mitochondria. Now this enzyme is mostly regulated uh, with the help of allosteric modification. Look at this enzyme. Some knowledge about this enzyme is so crucial. So this is an enzyme that has got 1180 amino acids. Okay, 1180 amino acids. So in the first amino acid to about 350 amino acid. That is the N terminus region. So this is an ATP grasping domain. Okay, ATP grasp domain. Now, in the last 80 amino acid, that is 1100 to 1180, this C terminus, this is the domain which is binding to biotin. So, this is the biotin binding domain. Now, remember this enzyme was discovered in uh, 1950. 
1959. So I'll rub this portion. So it is discovered in 1959 by a scientist called uh, Merton Otter. Okay, Merton Otter discovered this enzyme in 1959. Uh, now, uh, this is the tetrameric enzyme. So you know that there are four subunits. So each of the subunit has got roughly about 120 kilo Dalton. That is the molecular weight of each of the subunit. And each subunit can bind to a biotin. Remember, biotin was discovered only in uh, 1935. Biotin was discovered. So this biotin will act as a biotin. We have seen it earlier also. This act as a uh, carbon dioxide carrier. So this is linked to a lysine residue and it forms a long arm which is able to transfer carbon atom in the uh, to pyruvate and becomes oxaloacetic acid. So now in the most important allosteric molecule of pyruvate carboxylase is acetylcholine. Okay, this is the most important. There is a dispute at the moment because there has been some study showing that even acetyl-CoA levels are less in a cell, so it is still able to carry out. So there is a dispute, but to the best of our knowledge, acetyl-CoA becomes the most important allosteric activator of this pyruvate carboxylase enzyme. Unless acetyl-CoA is bound to this pyruvate carboxylase, this enzyme is not active. So this is an important aspect about pyruvate carboxylase enzyme. Uh, an inhibitor, so I'll put a negative sign, an inhibitor of this pyruvate carboxylase is ADP. ADP can act as uh, it is uh, an inhibitor of this enzyme. So this is how pyruvate carboxylase is regulated. In the next enzyme we have uh, in gluconeogenesis is PEP carboxykinase that will be converting oxaloacetic acid into phosphoenol pyruvate. Now PEP carboxykinase enzyme is very interesting because this, this enzyme it is a monomeric enzyme with a 74 kilo Dalton as the molecular weight. It is a monomeric enzyme. So it is basically it is a convert doing a conversion of oxaloacetic acid. It is a GTP driven conversion of oxaloacetic acid into PEP and uh, GDP. So this we have seen earlier also. Now uh, this enzyme can also be regulated in two ways: allosteric regulation as well as uh, uh, you know it can be activated. It, the gene transcription can be activated. So it is inhibited by the level of ADP. Now what is important at the moment is to how these hormones can play a role in, in transcribing PEPCK gene. Okay, let us look at that. It's very interesting. So what happens is especially uh, hormones like a glucagon. Okay, so glucagon um, it has an effect on, uh, um, it will, you know that it will activate cyclic AMB. We have seen all that pathway. Cyclic AMB result into overproduction of uh, protein kinase A. Now what happens is important now. This protein kinase A, it will, uh, it will phosphorylate a protein. And that protein is called CAMB response. CAMP response element binding protein. Okay, <clears throat> in the short form is um, CAMP response element binding protein. So it will phosphorylate and this protein becomes active now. Once this protein, because this is a transcription factor, so once this protein is active. Now this protein, and now this will be in the nucleus, this protein um, it will bind to CAMP response element. So that is we will write CAMP response element. So once it binds to CAMP response element um, on the gene, so it will increase the transcription. Let us uh, denote this by a simple diagram so therefore what happens is uh, you have CREB okay 
CAMB response element binding protein. So that will phosphorylate. So therefore, it is phosphorylated. So therefore, it is active. Okay. With the help of protein kinase, if all got phosphorylated, it is active. Now, this is going to uh, act on CAMP response elements. Now, the CAMP response element, this is the DNA. So, it has a binding site. Okay. So, therefore, this CAMP response element, it will bind here. So, once it binds, what it does is, it will activate. So, assume this is the Phosphor enone pyruvate uh, PEP carboxykinase enzyme gene. So, this gene is uh, the transcription of this gene is increasing. Okay, so the transcription increases. This is how uh, PEP carboxykinase is regulated.